Fefe, welcome. It's Thank great you. to be here at Sanford. Great to be with you. I do want to talk about the new book. It's out November 7th, I believe. Yeah. It's called The World's I See. And it's both a, a memoir uh, about coming to this country and uh, growing up here and your journey. And then, of course, your years building ImageNet and then being a leader in the field of AI. And now, of course, uh, the explosion of the field as well. So talk about what motivated you to write this book. Why this book? Why now? Well, it's a double helix structure. Uh, coincidentally, the coming of age of myself as a scientist and coming of age of AI as an impactful technology is really very uh, kind of track each other. And uh, so that motivated me to write a book. I, I, frankly, I was called to write a book, and uh, that was at the beginning of COVID. So I spent a year writing a nerdy book. I mean, nerdy still to the public, not a textbook. And my very good friend, uh, Former Stanford Provost John H. Mundy read my draft and said, you have to go back to the drawing board. I don't uh -oh. like what you wrote. <laughs> he said, a lot of AI scientists can write a popular book about AI, but the young women, students, and people of all walks of life and immigrants out there need a voice, and you have a unique voice. So that kind of forced me to write this double helix structure of, this is why we call it a science memoir, science first, but it is... It, it, it does revolve around a memoir timeline. Yeah. So one helix being your life, another helix being the science. The as AI, it the evolution yeah. of AI. Yeah. Early on in your life, you got very enamored with physics, which yes. of course we're excited about because we are AQ, we do AI and quantum. Talk to us about your love of physics at an early age and how did that stay with you? How did that influence your lens, your unique lens on AI? Yeah, so um, yes, I was a nerdy STEM kid and I love physics and Einstein particularly so much that um, I had to go to Princeton to major in physics. Uh, it was, you know, I'm sure you all watched the movie Oppenheimer and the opening scene and the ending scene was Einstein standing in front of that little pond by the Advance Institute. It was like two minutes away from my dorm and I went to that pond so much. So it was... Uh, a very uh, emotional, very to see emotional scene for me. So I loved about physics because it dares humanity to ask audacious questions. The questions that humans shouldn't have had an answer, like beginning of time, end of universe, smallest particles. The most fundamental Yeah, questions. the most fundamental that is so beyond the everyday imagination. Yet physics as a field propelled us to to go after these questions. And, and I think I still see AI through that lens. AI to me, actually, you probably meet more AI scientists seeing that from an engineering point of view. I see it from a science point of view. To me, Alan Turing dared humanity to ask the question, what is a thinking machine? And uh, I love the, 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 the duality of the thinking machine here, human intelligence, and uh, silicon-based thinking machine. And that's how it has informed my science. And uh, the book, if you notice, there is a bright North Star in, on the cover. is about a scientist looking for her North Star in the scientific quest. And, uh, and that's what physics is about. It's, it teaches us to go after the North Star questions. Fefe, talk to us about the human element of AI. You founded the institute here, HAI, here at Stanford. We're here on the Stanford campus. Uh, talk to us about that institute. And then my next question is going to be about this interaction between the academy and industry. There's always been a push and pull in terms of tech development. Uh, on the one hand, when we look back at the initial operating systems, Unix and others, those all came out of the university. Um, many universities, Berkeley, many others. But then a number of achievements have really been industry driven. And more recently, we are seeing a lot of the industry plays driving a lot of the AI, but there's still a strong role for open source and for academy. So talk to us first about HAI, but then also this question of open source, academy, industry, proprietary, your thoughts on that. Right. AI, as the book says, uh, has come of age, right? Just like me, myself being a scientist. And one of the most defining experience I had as an AI technologist was actually my sabbatical at Google Cloud, being the chief scientist uh, of AI. Um, 
between 2017 and 2018, that was my own sabbatical. So two things happened during my very illuminating and exciting uh, journey um, in Google or in industry in general. One is really making me realize that this technology is going to transform our society because it's so powerful. I was working with a cloud, you know, cloud business deal with all vertical businesses. I was literally working with developers like a Japanese cucumber farmer using TensorFlow all the way to Fortune 5 companies. And then, you know, financial services, healthcare, energy and oil, um, entertainment, retail and all that, right? So I see the power of this technology. And in the meantime, 2017, 2018 was the first time that we see messiness of this technology. We see we were at the heel of Cambridge Analytica um, event. We saw the first self-driving car deaths. We saw how facial recognition system is biased. We got um, debates, societal level debates about machine learning and defense. We got, you know, privacy issues. And as a scientist, I realized that I loved AI for, for my pure curiosity two decades ago. But now AI has grown up. It has entered the world with all the messy consequences. Some are intended, some are unintended. So who's going to guide that? How are we going to write the next chapter of AI in such a civilizationally impactful way? Industry is amazing, but we still need things beyond productization and uh, profit. And that's what I see my responsibility. I returned to Stanford and started the Human Center AI Institute. In a way, as a scientist, it was it has become my new North Star is technology needs to benefit humanity. Speaking of the relationship between industry and academia, I think it's really important that we have a very healthy ecosystem. Like you said, right? Unix came out of academia. Backpropagation and uh, neural network came out of academia. Absolutely. ImageNet came out of academia. But in the meantime, Transformer came out of industry. And BERT, you know, came out of industry. And all, so there's interplay. all this. Yeah, yeah. There's interplay. And now, ChatGPT obviously came out of industry, and also um, GPUs came out of industry. So I think it's so important that this ecosystem is very healthy. And I think that's what America's secret sauce is. We've always had the most healthy ecosystem of entrepreneurs, industry, public sector, blue sky research. And what I feel I am concerned right now is the imbalance. So in July, uh, June, I met with President Biden that the resourcing for AI development right now is so imbalanced. Not only public sector versus private sector, even within private sector is so imbalanced. I think it'll you want to see more democratized. Yeah, I want to yeah. see it more democratized. I also want to see we we do different things. Academia could be doing more, um, you know, we could do more scientific discovery. We could actually spend time to look under the hood and understand what's going on. We still don't have a good theory of deep learning till today, right? So um, you specifically ask about open source versus uh, closed source. The, the the world of co uh, computer science have really benefited from open source, Absolutely. right? So I think it's no doubt about it. And I think open source is not just software, it's also ideas. I look at archive, right? It's- uh, um, They just got a $10 million grant, thankfully, for more <laughs> effort, more support, so that's good. Yeah, <laughs> good. Uh, in the meantime, it's again, getting very messy because there are different forces at play here that's outside of tech innovation itself. And this brings me to the last point of partnership as we speak. Look at how many technology leaders, including yourself, um, are, are frequenting Capitol Hill, are frequenting Washington DC and next week uh, London. And uh, it's because this technology has become so impactful that 
some of the questions like open source versus closed source now has become a policy question. And it's not just this. So we have to bring people onto the same table and talk about all these things. When you think about what often happens in a when people get really focused on a particular technology that's taking off, that's uh, really expanding, sometimes we forget to look at other parts of that technology that then fall by the wayside, but we should have really looked at them. We know that happened in the history of, of tech and research in the last 20 years. So LLMs right now, everyone's talking about it, generative AI, but it's not the only form of AI. What areas of AI would you like to see more research go into, more dollars go into from, from industry, and from academia, what areas are not being focused on because of this maybe over-focus on LLMs right now? Right, uh, okay, great question, Jack. Um, I One area I already mentioned is scientific discovery, just as we're uh, filming this today. On Stanford campus, we're hosting our annual conference about Gen AI and the first major theme was scientific uh, discovery. I was so amazed to see people using these latest models for climate simulation, for protein sequencing, for sperm whale, sperm whale communication uh, decoding. Deciphering, yeah. Yeah, I think we need to invest in science. This is the kind of tooling that can get us cure rare diseases, map out our biodiversity, and find climate solutions, get fusion to work, right? So, so this is one area. The second, from more my own, closer to my own heart as an as a AI researcher, I think language model is just the first out of the gate. We're already seeing multi, uh, multimodal, but mostly language-driven, at least it's still in sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, tokenized models. But I were also, also hearing about industry investing in uh, large action models, yep. decision-making. I personally think we're, we're going to be seeing world models and um, mo deeply multimodal world models. So there is just a lot to come. Yeah, it's an exciting moment. I want to come back to the book, Fei Fei, for my final question. Who do you want to read this book? Who are you trying to reach? Uh, both adults right now, but also the next generation. What messages do you want them to walk away with from this book? Great question, Jack. Honestly, it was hard to map out this audience because when I was writing this book, one of the major persona I was writing this book for are especially the young women, the young people of diverse background, because I want them to see a path to find their own journey. In the meantime, to welcome them into the, to me, whimsical world of AI. In the meantime, I also want to say, why should a book written by a woman AI scientist only be read by people of diverse background? How, how, how about the Silicon Valley technologists, the engineers, and the, the, the um, famous people of Silicon Valley, you know, the TED audience, you yeah. know. So because this book is a science book, this is the first book that tells the AI story from perception, which is one of nature's oldest, you know, system of intelligence and a vision propelled the Cambrian explosion of animal species. There is just a beautiful science that go from vision, perception, all the way to today's AI explosion. So I hope this book is... Uh, we hope everyone reads it. ...has a um, wide audience. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of lessons, even just from what I know about the book. I'm so happy now to see the book physically printed. Sure. So that's great. Thank you for that. And so I hope that we can really come back maybe in a few months and look at the impact the book is starting to have in terms of widening people's understanding of where did all this AI come from? It didn't just show up just two days ago. This is something that you and a number of key pioneers really advanced over many decades. Uh, and I'm really glad that here at Stanford, you've established HAI to really think about the human impact of these technologies. And I hope that this book will have even a wider impact um, as we go out in this massive revolution. Thank you, Fei Fei, for Jack. joining us today. Yeah. Everyone, please check out the book, uh, The World's I See by Fei Fei Li. We'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.